All right. Good afternoon. Hey, I, I have two jobs at Intel. One is uh, managing the data center business, the storage, the networking, and the server infrastructure. The other is actually worrying about the next wave of connected devices. Uh, Intel's predicting 15 billion connected devices on the internet by 2015. And if you think that's conservative, Ericsson's out talking about 50 billion connected devices. So I get to worry about putting broadband into the car, uh, point of sale terminals, ATM machines, vending machines, all those kinds of fun things. But today I wanted to give you uh, at least Intel's perspective on what does it mean uh, for all this big data that we're talking about here today and what's happening back in the data center to uh, do the analytics behind uh, that big data. So first and foremost, um, just take a look at the numbers. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, 48 hours of YouTube video uploaded every single minute. 200 million tweets per day. I was trying to figure out what that was per second. Um, and 7.5 billion photos uploaded every month. Uh, today we're talking about 4 billion connected devices. And again, we're on a path that's going to just explode relative to 15 billion by 2015 and 50 billion predicted by 2020. And probably the, uh, the most amazing statistic I've heard in the last 10 years is that there was more data transmitted over the internet in 2010 than the entire history of the internet up until 2010. 245 exabytes or quintillion bytes of data in one year. So our vision is, is very simple. If it consumes electricity, it's going to ultimately end up computing. And if it computes, it's going to end up uh, connecting to the internet and generating data. And so putting that together, 300 exabytes of data this year and about $455 billion of enterprise spend. Now, we were uh, in a position before, very similar like we were today. You know, Intel introduced the Pentium Pro back in 1995 and had a great run delivering the standard high-volume server up until the year 2000 in the dot-com bust. And if you remember, everyone thought they had all the Spark Netra servers they needed in 2000, and they thought for several years the market would tail off and perhaps never get any bigger in the server space. And since then, we've delivered about 2.7 times the growth, up to uh, about 16 million chips a year from a market that was literally a couple hundred thousand. So why is that interesting from a Web 2.0 perspective? Well, you, you heard earlier about the investments required to get some of these businesses started. When, when Intel entered the server market, the average server price was $58,000. And today, we're under $3,800 and dropping. So once again, we're sitting here in 2010, and people are saying, hey, this is a slow growth market. And the simple prediction from Intel is that instead of doubling this business over the last 10 years, we're going to double it in the next five years. And there's some amazing statistics behind this data. Uh, we're assuming that in 2015, when you order a server as a line of business manager, three quarters of the time you order a server, you're going to get a virtual server, not a physical server. You're going to get a VM. You're not going to know you're getting a VM, but you're going to get a VM, not a physical server. So enormous growth. The other part is every single part of the business is growing, from mission-critical infrastructure converting from risk to Intel-based systems for the international banking transactions, to the private cloud infrastructure, to the small businesses, to uh, 3D movies and the workstation market. Uh, cloud and HPC obviously being our largest markets, growing uh, well over 20% compound annual growth rate, and now networking and storage. So that same standard high volume market that took a $58,000 risk server, drove it to $3,800 and made Facebook one of our largest customers as an end user, not just an OEM, is now happening to storage and to networking. So whether it's EMC or NetApp or HP or IBM or Dell or others, that storage infrastructure is converted from a couple years ago where Intel was less than 20% of that storage compute. Now, with EMC becoming kind of an a analytics appliance, not just dumb drives and sheet metal, uh, Xeon's becoming a fundamental element to that, and we'll end this year at about 80% share of uh, storage. And specifically for the Web 2.0 companies, as they flatten out the network, we're also seeing some of those proprietary ASICs that have driven very pr high-priced switching and routing convert over to Xeon-based infrastructure as well, 
So our business, particularly in the Web 2.0 companies and the top 10 routing and switching companies, is up about 60% uh, just in the last 18 months as well. So this whole concept of standard high volume, uh, standards-based servers, now moving into storage, now moving into switching and to routing, and all that's going to help drive down the cost of services. Our simple vision at Intel, we're going to add a billion people to the Internet by 2015, going from 1.5 billion to 2.5 billion people. So you take that combined with those 15 billion devices, and our vision is basically to connect everyone to everything. And that's before we talk about machine to machine. So I thought I'd give you just a couple uh, examples of what are we going to do with big data. You know, if you have all this data available to us, you're in, you're in data overload. What are some of the kind of interesting things that we're seeing out there? Well, the U U.S. Geographical Society about a year ago started the Twitter Earthquake Detection Project. How many people have been part of TED? Nobody. All right. You gotta, we're in San Francisco, right? <laughs> there was a, uh, an earthquake in Virginia August 23rd of 2011, and uh, it took several minutes for the U.S. Geographical Society to actually understand it's an earthquake. Uh, but within one minute, there were 40,000 tweets that had gone out on the earthquake, and it actually reached New York City, which felt the rumbling of there, uh, far ahead of the actual official uh, U.S. Geological Survey saying that uh, New York was going to get hit. Now, that's interesting in and of itself, but if you look at 5,500 tweets a second, uh, if you're in an area that has less seismic detectors and stuff, it could save real lives in the future as you get out into some of the uh, emerging markets. If you look at what happened in Japan, the average network traffic is that little yellow line. And while most of the infrastructure was down, most of the mobile network, including the WiMAX network in Japan, was actually up. Uh, Intel, our scuba sales office, was hit immensely. Sprinkler systems were going off, water was flowing up on the floors, ceilings were caving in, and literally within minutes on their WiMAX enabled notebooks, uh, you can see the amount of data traffic. We were getting live pictures and even videos of what was going on in Japan. So the key message here is, you know, you, you can never predict, and the new reality of the world is that you're going to have these huge spikes whenever there's an incident, whenever there's a political uprising that was just talked about. Uh, whenever there's a natural disaster, we have to have infrastructure that's reliable, available, and scalable so that it just doesn't go down and we can do a pretty good job of, of saving lives in the future. Now, the other example is we've basically delivered a 550x improvement in performance at 500 times lower cost since we've been in this kind of supercomputing class business. And at the end of the day, big data analytics is like supercomputing. In 1985, when Intel first got into the server business, uh, you could predict a hurricane two days in advance at about a 300-mile radius. So what that basically means is if a hurricane's heading towards New York or Boston, you're evacuating millions and millions of people because you just don't know the prediction. I just had this experience about a month ago in Tokyo. One of the, uh, the typhoons was heading that way, and they literally didn't know two days in advance where they were going to shut down the Narita Airport, move the planes out, because you had one of those cones going out with just two days' notice, right? Now look, today, you're analyzing terabytes of data, and we can only get basically a 48-hour warning still, but we're now down to a 100-mile radius. So we've improved the accuracy of this prediction, so you're, you're only evacuating about a third of the population that you would have before. But the goal, if you look out to NASA, is actually to deliver a million times the performance that we can today. To get basically the same forecasted accuracy in your weather two weeks in advance as you can get in tomorrow or the next day's forecast. And then we can get down to evacuating basically just a zip code, a 10-mile radius. So what we've done to supercomputing and the economics of supercomputing, delivering 500 times the compute at 500 times less power, uh, or, or, or uh, cost, rather, is fundamental to what we're going to do in big data analytics. And so at supercomputing, I made a declaration, uh, hopefully in conjunction with the U.S. government, that we'll deliver a supercomputer 125 times more powerful than today at only two times the power by 2018. And so we fundamentally believe Moore's Law is alive and well. The performance is going to continue as it has, and we're predicting big things. So if you look at how to go solve some of these most difficult problems in the world, uh, you'll see that 
not just in weather prediction, but in cancer detection. We had cancer detection that used to cost uh, millions of dollars, take two and a half hours to get the results. You can now basically do real-time CT scans on the operating table at 10 petaflops. So the world's largest supercomputer today, if it was available in a CT scanner, could do a real-time CT scan while the, opera while the doctor was operating on the table. And we're a few years away from getting that down to seconds uh, of, of real-time operating. Genome sequence used to cost about a million dollars to get a genome sequenced. We're a couple years away from it being less than a thousand dollars. So you can get medications basically tailored directly to you, um, tailored to your specific, specific genome sequence. So the key message is from Intel, adding a billion people to the internet from one and a half to two and a half billion people, connecting 15 billion connected embedded devices by 2015 up from about 4 billion. We see a massive amount of data growing. We said uh, 300 exabytes already this year, growing to well over 1,000 exabytes of data crossing the internet by 2015. And Moore's Law, uh, alive and well, driving not only into the server space, but specifically for Web 2.0 into the storage, the networking, switching and routing space as well. Thank you very much. One second.